lovely government students. How are we doing on this brand new week? Hope everybody is doing well. Hope you had a great weekend. Hope you had a happy, beautiful Monday. Uh, today, we are going to continue our political parties discussion by talking about how did political parties evolve? Because believe it or not, um, it didn't always look like it looks now. It's not like, you know, we were found in 1776 and we had the Democrats and Republicans as we have them today. They've evolved quite a bit over history. Um, so, before we get into all the nitty gritty details, just a few reminders. Today, you do not really have like a, an assignment like you have been having. There's no like matching activity or anything like that. Um, it's just notes. So, I hope you are taking notes in some way, shape, or form. Of course, you could take it on a Word document, a Google Doc, handwritten notes. Totally up to you. Totally your call. Um, we will eventually have a test on. Uh, or a quiz or some kind of assessment on political parties. So all this will come in handy. Of course, you can always look back at these videos, but it might just be easier for you to take a look at your notes, whatever works. Um, a reminder again. Here's everything that's been to you so far. Uh, you've had your Know Your Government project. I've already called a few people about that. Please, please, please make sure you get it in. Um, as, uh, the extra credit, which was the escape room. And then two activities, a matching activity and the party system strengths and weaknesses, Google form, multiple choice. So most people that handed that in, uh, again, you might be hearing from me this week if uh, I have not gotten anything from you yet. Um, so the thing that we need to think about uh, eventually, in the start of this lesson, I guess, would be how many political parties should there be? You learned all about those strengths and weaknesses. Um, now, we're going to go into what some of the founding fathers thought and then what happened how did we get the way we are right now how did we do it well george washington my friends warned us against political parties he you know when he makes his farewell address he gives us a couple of uh guidelines he thinks we should follow and the one that he says is listen we can't be forming into to parties especially not two for instance, however, political parties may now and then answer popular ends. They are likely in the course of time and things to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. Oh my gosh, what the heck does that mean? He's basically saying that, listen, even though political parties are going to, like, answer political, um, popular problems. They're going to be popular. They're going to be very helpful. In the course of time, as time goes on, um, cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men, so men who, or women, or people, I guess, who really don't have the best outlook for the country, they're going to be able to come to power and take all the power away from us, from the people, and take control of the government. So he is saying that political parties are going to enable people to have an unfair amount of power and kind of take away the democracy of America, I guess. Um, and do we listen to George? Mm, not quite. So we're going to watch this video right here that kind of starts to explain our two-party system. Keep in mind, friends, it's from a while ago. So this is from when Hillary was running against Trump. So not this current election, the one before. Um, hang on, we got we got to do some movie magic. We got it, we got it. Technical difficulties, my goodness. All right, so let's take a look. How how does the U.S. end up with a two-party system, friends? We're here at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and tonight Hillary Clinton will accept the nomination as the Democratic presidential candidate. A lot of voters upset with the Democratic pick are looking to a third-party option, but in the last 163 years, the president has been either a Democrat or a Republican. So how did the United States end up with this exclusive two-party system? Well, it's important to note that the U.S. has not always operated this way. During the first official presidential election, there were no political parties, and George Washington won without even campaigning. And in fact, most of the founding fathers were skeptical of political parties. In his famous farewell address, Washington argued that opposing parties would mercilessly seek to undermine each other at the expense of the American people. Nevertheless, by the time he left office in 1797, the country had split into two parties, the elitist and business-minded Federalists and a working-class Democratic Republican Party. This persisted until the mid-1800s, by which time the Federalists had dissolved and the Democratic Republicans had split into the modern Democratic Party and the new Republican Party. 
After a brief 20-year run as the Whig Party, the new Republicans evolved into just Republicans. So by 1854, the U.S. had what we know today as the Democratic and Republican parties. Their duopoly has persisted over the last century and a half, largely because of the country's unique first-past-the-post voting system. That is, each state has a set number of electorates, and whichever candidate gets the majority of votes, even by a fraction, wins all of those electorates. There is no reward for second place and therefore little incentive to create a party that will get some votes but not the majority. For example, in the 1992 presidential election, independent candidate Ross Perot received nearly 20% of the popular vote and still did not garner a single electoral vote. The United States is one of just a few countries that has this first-past-the-post system. As a result, most other democracies see representation from more than just two parties. Japan, for example, sees representation from five major parties, as well as a number of minor parties. And in Israel, ten parties or party affiliates are represented in the national legislature. That's because these countries use proportional representation to elect officials rather than a winner-take-all system. Many have argued that America's two-party system is unjust, not only because it limits voters' options at the polls, but because it encourages politicians to go to great, oftentimes shady lengths to grow their party. One example of this is gerrymandering. Because voters will ostensibly vote just one of two ways, policymakers can easily draw up and manipulate voting districts to favor their own party. The electoral system also creates an environment where parties aim to be as large as possible, even if it means absorbing ideas that don't necessarily square with their base. As a result, voters will identify less and less with their party over time. For the last two weeks, we've been at both the RNC and the DNC getting a feel for the future of politics here in the U.S. We sat down with other YouTube creators to talk about the changing face of American voters and how demographic trends may impact. Okay, okay. We don't need to, to learn about all that. But uh, interesting, isn't it, about how um, it works? We talked about before we were sent home um, the difference between like a direct democracy and kind of what we have, the representative democracy. Um, and we talked about the um, electoral college. That's actually what I was looking for. Like the electoral college, how it doesn't, it's not as simple as we think, which is going to vote for a presidential election, right? So we see that come into play here. All right, hold on one more time, please. And we're back. Okay, so there you go. And a little bit of an example of what had happened with um, the two parties, how we got here. So to go into a little bit more depth, um, so we need to remember that the Federalist Party, that was weird how that happened, <laughs> originated in the early 1790s and it was led by Alexander Hamilton. I, uh, you heard me hesitate because I was going to sing like from the musical because I'm obsessed with that musical, but then I was like, mm, I'm recording this and that will be proof forever. And I, I just, you know, I thought, I thought twice about it. So Alexander Hamilton leads the Federalist Party, right? And he favors a very strong national government and thinks that the government's strength is going to help protect the economy and the rights of the people. So he wants to put more power in the national government as a whole. Um, for those of us, you know, who might, who might be familiar with the musical or just Alexander Hamilton in general, remember, he um, doesn't have a very passionate love for a single state because he came from outside of the 13 colonies and he has more of a passion in this newfound government that he helps create. Oh, please excuse me. Hold on. Sorry about that, friends. Um, okay. So, you know, you know, I had to do it. You know, I had to put some of those gifs from there. All right. I won't torture you anymore. Although if you're interested, totally worth listening to the soundtrack. I'm just saying. Okay. So who's going to come up against um, Hamilton. And again, uh, some of us should know right away, it's going to be Thomas Jefferson, and he is going to lead the Democratic Republican Party. That is one party, right? Even though our brains automatically kind of um, separate them, uh, it is one party that's originated in the 17, 1790s. Now, you all should have some familiarity with the subject from last year, but uh, just in case, again, to go over it, it's Jefferson's party, the Democratic Republican Party, that really does support state rights over the power of that national central government. Um, they think that the states should be given more power than the national government, and that if the states have more power, they can protect the people better. It makes sense. Jefferson from Virginia has a, a, a love for Virginia, like a loyalty to it, so he thinks that uh, loyalty to the states is more important. Something to consider. Now, here are the different. I have the chart up here. 
feel like oh what what in the world what oh oh my goodness so um and this chart is it actually works it's filled out for you guys already um but the difference is between the two uh this is the biggest uh point wants to support a strong federal government is the federalists right federal federal um democrat republicans want to support strong state governments that's the most important thing you need to know okay so what happens well that democratic republican party um it's going to split because the federalist federalist party totally collapses in 1820 we have the democratic republican party becoming a dominant one um and what happens is it becomes so popular that lots of different candidates are going to run under that name but the thing is all those different candidates have different ideas so when Andrew Jackson ends up running for president, party lines start to form within the party. So those who support him call themselves the Democratic Party. Those who are against him refer to themselves as National Republicans. That's important. National Republicans. All right, so federalism, bye. Sorry, Alexander Hamilton. Jefferson's like, you know, woohoo, my party, my legacy lives on. Except when Andrew Jackson runs for president, that party um, splits up. And we have the Democratic Party and the National Republicans. The Democratic Party, still the same party we have today, but their platforms have changed quite drastically. All political parties do over time. What do I mean by that? I mean that the Democratic Party, um, right here, this, this party, is technically the same party we have right now. However, what they believed in back in 1820 is very different from what they believe in now. Of course, times change, culture changes, people change, makes sense. I do not care what political party it is. Chances are, you know, a political party that's been around since, uh, you know, 1900 versus 2020 are going to have some different beliefs. Um, you hear people say all the time, well, you know, if it was the 60s, they probably would have been this, but I'm this now. Like, it's just something that you hear all the time. Now, the Republican Party had a bit more morphing to do. Um, by 1834, the National Republicans were replaced by the Whig Party. Um, again, a strong support on state rights and focusing on internal improvements within the country. Um, that party's going to fall apart due to disagreements about slavery. And those who are opposed to slavery form the Republican Party. Right? Lincoln was a Republican. He was opposed to slavery. That's how we can always remember that. That's the same party we have today. But again, like every other political party, their platforms have certainly changed over time. Are we going to watch this video? Am I going to torture you by making you watch this video? No. But if you want to just look it up, um, I will show you the title here. It's how to break the two-party hold on American politics. In all honesty, it's not torture. It's a really cool video, and the animations are awesome. Um, I'm just going to run out of time, so I don't want to uh, run out of time on you guys before talking a little bit more about what you got to do. So please make sure you check it out. Um, it's awesome sauce. We're back. Okay, and so what is your assignment if I'm not giving you a Google form? Well, here's your assignment. Please, please, please make sure you understand everything about this lesson. Um, look it over a couple times. It gets a little confusing. If you have the slightest question or comment or concern, you are emailing me right here. Um, I love to hear from you guys. Let me know if you're liking these videos. Let me know if you're watching these videos. Should I give extra credit if you email me and say like, oh, I watched the video, Miss H? Maybe I'll do that. All right, how about this? Extra credit if you email me right now and say, ooh, I watched the video, Miss H. I don't care what day it is. If you're watching this, you know, two weeks in the future, email me. I want to know. I want to know if, you, if you're watching my videos. Say, Miss H, it's a good thing you didn't sing Miss ha uh, Hamilton because my ears would have bled. Just saying. And the other thing you're going to do is you are going to make sure you've submitted everything so far for this quarter. Please, 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 please. We want excellent, amazing, fabulous, good grades. And that's all I got. If you have any single question, my friends, email me. Email me even if you don't have a question. That way I can give you some extra credit. I'm just saying. All right. I miss you guys so much. I hope all is well. Sorry I was a little crazy today. I'm going a little stir crazy in my house. I think I need to release some energy. So poor seniors, you gotta, you gotta listen to me go on and on. Uh, all right. And that's it guys. Stay safe, stay healthy. And I will uh, talk to you on Thursday. Bye friends.